because it was very soon after that that I got sick and was rushed into Addenbrooke's Hospital in the middle of the night and very frightened because they couldn't figure it out and I had a roaring temperature and a pain in my stomach that wouldn't quit. I found myself flat on my back with one way to look and one way only and that's how God got my attention and that was up. And God in his mercy put in a ward of 30 women put the one, I don't know how many others there were in that ward, but the one believer, I think the first Christian I ever met in so-called Christian England, or that I was aware of in my whole life. And she was the girl who told me that God walked down the stairway of heaven with a baby in his arms and put him in a bale of hay and set this world on fire. I'd never heard the gospel. And I grabbed it with both hands. And she led me thoroughly, totally, irrevocably to Christ. And she used Revelation 3.20, out of context, but it worked. <laughs> and she got halfway through the verse. Behold, I stand at the door and, knock, and I said to her, I know about the door. She said, what, what do you mean you know about the door? I said, I know about the door. There is a door opened in the middle of the world, one day she came. <laughs> Where did you read that? And I said, pamphlets. Who wrote it? I don't know. Lewis? Oh, oh, she said, really? And then she explained things about the door. And I said to her, take me through it. Please. Please take me through it. And she did. Never been the same. How could I be? Huh? How could anybody be? Ever the same again? And God walked into my life in that ward that day and I began the transformation for I had become a new creature in Christ. All things, though I knew it not, were passed away and all things had become new. And she did a good job on me because she gave me, two days later, a pile of books B-O-O-K-S, books. <laughs> and looking back, I've tried to remember what those first five books uh, were. And the one I do remember was called C.T. Stuff, which was Weck's <coughs> story of C.T. Stud, who was a Cambridge student. And uh, in my day and age, was a famous missionary story. And that was my first ever look into the world of mission. And it happened while I was just a new convert in hospital before I got better and had to leave. I didn't want to leave. I wanted to stay sick and learn and learn and learn because <laughs> I was quite sure there was nobody else like Jenny outside the hospital. And I do remember saying to her, does anybody else know about this, Jenny? She said, what do you mean, anybody else? I said, well, who knows about what you told me, what's happened? Does anybody else know in England? She said, well, what a weird question. I said, well, no, it's a serious question, because I've never heard till now if somebody else knew, and they hadn't told me, I, I couldn't believe that. I mean, if they knew all this, and, and, and they hadn't come to tell me. And so she was silent for a minute. And I said, you mean other people know, like the people that go to church? And she said, yeah. I said, really? And she said, well, don't get down on those people, Jill, just because they didn't tell you. From now on, everybody that comes into the orbit of your life must hear. Look, as the head nurse, tell her. What? <laughs> tell, her, tell her what? Tell her what you've just done. I have no idea, but I did what I was told. I did everything she told me, and she took full advantage of me. <laughs> so I struggled with the head nurse, and believe it or not, she went and got the psychiatrist. <laughs> True story. And he rushed to my bedside and took my pulse and said, I hear you're having religious thoughts. <laughs> and I said to Jenny, is that what I'm having? She said, yes, you're having religious thoughts. I said, tell him, tell him. She that day, I think it was seven people, seven nurses and somebody else, uh, that I struggled through. And each time, it 
got easier and better. For if we confess with our lips the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart, we shall be saved, right? I have no idea. I met that verse much later in my life. And so those books she gave me became the beginning of my training, my seminary. And I've never had the opportunity to go formally to seminary. But God put me in Cambridge with C.S. Lewis and John Stott and Jim Packer and the theologians of my day. I had no idea what a theologian was. And the mission impact on my life. It wasn't but six months, I think, after I came to Christ that the five missionaries were martyred in Ecuador. And that was world news. That was Cambridge news. And by then, I had read C.T. Studd, and I understood what a missionary was. And then Billy Graham came. My last year up there, I think, or next to last year. And the last time that we'd had an evangelist of that stature was when Moody went to Cambridge. And as a result of Moody going to Cambridge, the Cambridge Seven were sent out into the world. And Hudson Taylor was one of those students, one of the Cambridge Seven. When Moody went, those seven converts offered for mission. And they changed the world. They became the piercing uh, first in <laughs> Navy SEALs, if you wish, the guard of continents. And as, of course, you know, your own WEC story, C.T. Stead. And it was that one book that gave me such a thirst to have enough time, God. Give me a long enough life. Uh, give me a life. Give me a life that I have the choice to follow these examples and to do these things. Um, I remember not too long ago, I suppose 10 years, 15 years ago, Stuart and I were in Thailand, and we went to do an OMF missionary convention. Uh, we uh, invited to go and do the teaching at the missionary conventions. What a privilege that is. And to learn as we stay at those conventions and learn what's happening through the missionaries. And it was the time when Time magazine put on the front cover an American soldier with a prostitute in his hands. I don't remember if you remember this. I certainly vividly remember it. And it says, AIDS capital of the world, Pattaya, Thailand, or Pattaya in Thailand. And um, just before we got there, this Time magazine came out. And the mafia, the sex mafia, have Pattaya, which is a beautiful, gorgeous holiday place in Thailand, just sewn up. And uh, when that Time magazine article came out, Pattaya emptied. It has more hotels than any other place in the world, I'm told. I was told. And they all emptied because of this AIDS scare, AIDS capital of the world in Pattaya. And uh, the missionaries took full advantage of it because the hotels were empty and offered for about a dollar a day if anybody wanted to come and stay. And they put their convention in Pattaya. And Stuart and I went and taught that convention um, in the mornings. And one day, halfway through, um, a missionary said to me, have you been out? Have you seen what's happening in Pattaya? And I said, no, I haven't. She said, come on, bring your camera. And I remember going up and down the streets of Pattaya, just uh, overwhelmed with the sex stuff. And all the pedophiles painting their little children, gold and silver, ready for the sex shows that started in midday in Pattaya, up and down the street. And she kept saying, just show, take a picture. I said, I can't take a picture of that. I just can't, I'm sick. And we went down to the beach and we just knelt down and prayed for Pattaya. And I said, where's the church? She said, the Mafia have got this, the church is on the outskirts. I said, where's YWAM? Where's OM? I know these kids are reachable. We did it. We did it for 11 years in Europe, street work, reaching kids on the streets. Um, there has to be something here. And she said, well, uh, no. And I remember kneeling down, praying a very silly prayer. Give me a little 
And I knew God wasn't going to do that. And so I prayed, okay, take me back to America, take me back to my world, and help me reach the next generation. Help me reach the next generation. And since then, I suppose I was coming up to 50 at that time, I have had this huge burden on my heart to do for this next generation what Janet Smith did for me in hospital. Because that's our job. Psalm 71, verse 16 to 18, Even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, O Lord, until I have declared your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. That's our job. And whether we do it through books, whether we do it through presence, and we can't go everywhere, but we can all go somewhere, and whether we do it by internet, and whether we do it, yes, by all these things, it must be done. Because this generation like me is screaming, if only someone would tell me. Yes, they are. They don't look like it, they don't act like it, but they're screaming, if only someone would tell me. And I suppose that's why at this point in my life, I'm trying to maximize the word in books, in magazines, in whatever way we can. Just, how can we get the word out? I remember scribbling a poem, realizing the power of the Word of God not long ago. Words of God on golden page, words of life that never age, touching heart, transforming mind, treasure rich for humankind. Words of God are mine to read, Words of God, my spirit feed. Words that teach me righteousness, so humbled I my sin confess. Living words that light my way, encourage me when low I lay. Words that comfort all my days, words that turn my pain into praise. Run I to the soul's deep place, falling prostrate, seek your face. Find myself in your strong arms, safe, secure from all alarms. Word of God, a fortress high, till the trouble passes by. Words of God, I must declare, preaching Jesus everywhere. Golden gifts, you are to me. Gospel, setting people free. Help me use the Spirit's sword, words of God from my great Lord. Truth enfleshed in Christ who came. O living world. I praise you. Words. That's what CLC is all about. That's what CLC is all about. That's what we should be all about. Words of God on golden page. Christ and flesh. We see.